Well, thank you for that uh, generous introduction, and I, <clears throat> I feel uh, humility more than I feel readiness. A little bit of capability, but more humility right now um, as I find myself having to speak after having enjoyed very much the trip here and having enjoyed um, so much that has been given to me and all of us, um, especially by Jamal Nur Hoja, uh, but also in the larger sense by Kanan Rafai. And I am, was sitting trying to think of what I could do, and I, I realized there's something I can do that nobody else has done yet. And I would like to say that for the languages I can't speak, as well as the ones that I can, I am grateful to translators. So I'd like us to pause for a moment and thank the people who translate for us. We all believe in El Ghaib, but sometimes El Ghaib has voices and they're the translators. So I'm going to myself talk today about a subject very dear to my heart, but one where His Excellency Kanan Kursai knows much more, and many of you know much more than I do, uh, the reflections of Kanan Rafai on the notion of the Mi'raj of the Prophet. And in order to put it in some perspective, I am comparing his reflections to Samah with those of uh, Sheikh Muzaffar in his book, Irshad, and several reflections from Ibn Arabi. And again, I say I hesitate to speak about this because with James Morris and also uh, Bill Chittick in the audience, um, I hesitate to say anything about the Miraj, according to Ibn Arabi, that they haven't said and said better. So let me give my few humble reflections about the Miraj of the Prophet with reference to Sheikh Muzaffar, uh, Ibn Arabi, and also Kanan Rifai. It's certainly one of the most arresting narratives in the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he ascends to heaven after a journey from Mecca to Jerusalem, the Miraj after the Isra. And you all know this from Surah al Najm, but let me give you the translation in English that comes from my friend Shaukat Turawa, which attempts to rhyme a little bit of the Arabic in English. By the star when it sets, your companion neither worries nor frets, nor does he ever speak with regrets. It's only revelation that he begets. It's one mighty in power who projects and propels him upward to what perfects far beyond the horizon where the sun sets, nearer and nearer to the source he trajects, so close that a mere bowline between them intersects. And so what is this mi'raj that's described here in Surah Al-Najm from the Quran? At the first level, according to Sheikh Musafir, there are many angels and the Prophet Muhammad who greet the Prophet, peace be upon him. At the second level, it's other prophets, Isa and Yahya, who hail him. At the third level, he meets Joseph and Solomon. At the fourth level, it's Musa, his mother, Pharaoh's wife, along with Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. At the fifth level, he meets the prophets Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and Lot. Then, at the sixth level, the prophets Idris and Noah. And finally, at the seventh level, dazzled by yet another chorus of angels, he finds in their midst the prophet Abraham. And Ibrahim greets Muhammad warmly, but then bids him farewell as the prophet journeys onward alone, journeys onward alone to the lotus tree. While this narrative is taught, the differences in its interpretation are manifold. For instance, between Sheikh Muzaffar and Sheikh Al Akbar ibn Al Arabi, there's even a disagreement about which prior prophets and which prophetic relatives the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, met at each level. And as I said, it's to James Morris. I have a hard time calling him Jim up here. Jim in private, but James in public. It is to Professor James Morris that we all must be grateful for providing a very concise exposition in a wonderful book edited by Michel Chodkowitz, in which Bill Chittick also has wonderful chapters. But in that, James Morris talks about all the three sources from which he draws in talking about the Miraj of Sheikh Al Akbar, Kitab al Israr, Isat al Anwar, and of course, most importantly, the 167th chapter of Futahat al Makiyya. And there you have a different sequence than with Sheikh Musafir. To be sure, you have Adam in the first heaven and Ibrahim in the seventh, but the journey is a little different in between. 
There's Isa and Yahya in the second, but then Yusuf in the third, Idris in the fourth, Harun, Aaron in the fifth, and Musa in the sixth. And as Jim or James Morris notes himself, Ibn Arabi's analysis and list reflects his own sense of the inner spiritual journey that's signified by each of these prophetic encounters. And then he goes on to note in what I think is a marvelous insight that this experience of the Miraj of the Prophet Muhammad also resembles the sequence of the chapters in Fasus al Hikam, the famous and much commented on book by Ibn al Arabi. And the missing of Shaykh al Akbar ibn al Arabi most closely resembles the account of the Miraj found in Sahih Muslim, where the prophets are given in the order that I just mentioned. But I don't want to focus on those differences. Instead, I want to look at Kanan Rafai and his own intense inner journey. It's as if Ibn Arabi anticipates the approach that exceptionalizes Kanan Rafai's account. And what is that? To etch and then evoke the correspondence between the Mi'raj of the Prophet, Mi'raj of Rasul, and Mi'raj of Mu'min, the ascent in the heart of each believer. And of course, I rely, as others have relied, on the marvelous translation of Victoria Holbrook from the partial commentary on the Masnavi of Kanan Rafai, and I'm going to use some of the examples from her wonderful translation in what I say that follows. There are four passages that concern me where Kanan Rafai talks about the Miraj. The first comes early in, the resp in response to the story of the Padishah, who meets the divine physician. Most of you, I think, know this story very well. Kanan Rafai interprets it, and this is his words, or the word, his words as translated by uh, Victoria Holbrook. It is a silent, wordless meeting. It is an attempt to wrestle between the tension of ishqi majaze and ishqi haqiqi, between what be called metaphorical love and true love. And at this moment, the intellect becomes impotent. In Kanan Rafai's words, he, the intellect, is ashamed of the incapacity and insufficiency of what he has said and prefers to remain silent. Here we face the irony and limits of the human intellect. It understands and describes all beings, but it, when it comes to love, it's as if tongue-tied. And this is the poet who comes to my mind. Kasi sirash namidanan zabandar kash zabandar kash. No one knows his secret. Shut up, shut up. Be quiet, be quiet. And the spiritual insight of Kanan Rafai then pivots in a novel way to engage this age-old conundrum. The intellect is part of the ascent, but the intellect can go only so far. Now, others of you may know where he takes this from. I would think it's a work of his own genius, but others can, and I hope will correct me. If he quotes it, it's a brilliant quote. If he makes it from his own wonderful imagination, it's even better. He compares the stunted, silenced intellect with the Archangel Gabriel. And here he underscores how instrumental beauty can be and always is coupled with ontological futility. The intellect, like Gabriel, can only go so far. To quote from his commentary in Holbrook's wonderful translation. This is why the angel Gabriel, <clears throat> who accompanied Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, as far as the Siddha tree during the Mi'raj, said when they said when they passed the frontier of intellect and came to the frontier of love, O oh, messenger of God, I cannot go on. If I take one step further, I will catch fire and burn up. Some of you may recall yesterday <clears throat> when I, I must say, of, of all the many things I've enjoyed here is these wonderful images that we've had playing behind us before we begin to our, with our intellects to try and say something about Kanan Rafai. We've had these marvelous recollections behind us. And I was particularly taken when uh, Aziza was talking about the fact that she met Kanan Rafai and she felt as if she was going to be on fire and burn up. And I said her expression and the pathos and wonder in her face reminded me of this couplet from Rumi, Hasale ish kazin se sochan peishnist, sochtam o sochtam o sochtam. The sum total, total, the sum total of love is but three words. It, of course, is the same word in Persian. Sochtam o sochtam o sochtam. I burn 
I burn, I burn. And the same threat of annihilation through fire, the fire of Ishq, stops Gabriel later in the same commentary when once again Kanan Rafai explains the Mi'raj as a spiritual experience of the prophet first of all, but then as an example and also a possibility for others who seek truth. These are his words in Holbrook's translation. Earlier, for the seeker of truth, it was his heart which was teacher of intellect to him and conducted his training by way of intellect. But when the knowledge of God, the truth, haq ilmi, covers his being, intellect becomes student to him. And this person whose heart has been occupied by love of God accomplishes the spiritual mi'raj. And how do we understand this? He goes on to say, to transcend the limit of the intellect is to go beyond the point where Gabriel stopped. While Gabriel was ascending to God with Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, on the Miraj, they came to a point where he said, O oh Muhammad, if I take one step further, the light of self-disclosure will burn me, destroy me. This is my limit. And he remained behind while Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him, continued on the path to reach God. Now, I think I could stop my paper here. Some of you may wish I would because we've had some very long, interesting papers. But I have just a little more to tell you because the Lex two stories, in my view, are the best. They also come from Kanan Rafai. They also come from Sama or Listen. And they are beyond what anything you could have imagined or I could have imagined before I got to this point in reading the Holbrook translation. Because what we find next is where the journey is not the individual journey, either of the Prophet Muhammad or of us ourselves, it is a collective journey. It is never a journey we make alone, it is a journey we make in the company of others. And this is how it's described with reference to the Masnavi by Kanan Rafai. The first commentary is a tale about the attributes of the wings of the birds of divine intellects. It plays on the oxymoron what happens when we collectively, together, arrive at the place that is no place, makan la makan? As he says in his commentary, it's the secret of Solomon, the great prophet and lover of birds. It alludes, alludes to each lover who liked the parrot, and Karim did not ask me to include this, even though he likes parrots. It alludes to each lover who, like the parrot, wants to flap its wings and fly in space to the realm of not place. And here I'm reminded of another poem from the great Indian poet Amir Khusro, Namidanam Che Manzul Bud Shab J K Man Budam. Bihar Su Rakse Bismir Bud Shab J K Man Budam. And it goes on for several lines, but then it ends with this final couplet, Khoda Khud Miri Majlis Bud under Lama Khan Khusro, Muhammad Shame Mafal Bud. So I did not know what this place was, the night, the place where I came. Around every corner, there was the Lakse Bismil. I don't quite have words to translate it, but it's a dance of the bird that's been sacrificed, but it's a sacrifice of all of us who have tried and struggled on the way of Ishq. So everywhere there is a dance that's performed by the Bismil in this place which we don't know. And at the end of it all, it's God himself, Chodachud, who happens to be the master, Ander Lama Khan, in the place that is no place. And Muhammad is the candle that evening, the place where I was. And it wasn't until I was writing this paper, I thought, this, of course, is all about the Mi'raj. This is Khusro. Everybody who's ever been to India and been to a Majlis and been to a Samach has heard this. But it's actually Khusro reflecting himself and his own experience of Mi'raj. So Kanan Rafai takes us to this place, but what is so beautiful and I think singular about his depiction is that he only takes us there in a collective journey. We never fly alone. Whether a bird or a person, we fly with others. It's always in a flock of those soaring higher and higher. And here is his words also from this wondrous commentary. Such lovers have a mi'raj, an ascent to God, 
not once, but every instant. They have the wings of the lights to which they ascend and the pleasure of divine witness in the realm of spirits. Crowns of light are placed on their heads by the hand of divine power. Wah, wah, wah. Neither the intellect nor the ordinary believer can imagine, much less experience such a state. It erases not just space, but also time. And then he goes on to, to imagine what this is like. On that day, this is the Yom Kiyama, spirits purified of, worthly, of worldly filth will like angels, quoting from the Holy Quran, ascend unto him in a day, the measure which is 50,000 years. On that day, they rise to God the truth, and while the angels cannot approach God beyond a certain degree, beyond the Sidra tree, Sidra Muntaha, the Mi'raj of the spirits passed beyond that degree, as did Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this ascension of God's friends, the awliya Allah, this will make even the heavens tremble. This ascension of God's friends will make even the heavens tremble. And this phrase in this passage comes towards the end of the commentary, explaining that one must keep one's own state and intoxication hidden from others, especially those who might not know or misinterpret. It's a radiant image of collective exuberance and the divine presence, and it presages where I want to end my paper and where the commentary also ends. Listen, listen, not just to hear and absorb, to learn and love, to learn to love, to run and to burn. Listen in silence and patience beyond the sophistry of the tongue or insight, however keen of the intellect. And now I'm quoting Kanan Rafai. Be silent until the waters are purified and display the sublime mysteries beneath. For God who clouds waters will purify them again. Patience is half of faith and the way to the greatest of victories let us know that only God knows and performs the best, the most righteous of works. Only God knows and performs the best, the most righteous of works. So if the angelic host is great, its chorus fulsome, greater still beyond all reckoning is the mirage me of the spirits, the collective ascension of God's friends, its force so great that even the heavens tremble. There's another Sufi giant, Sheikh Nizam al-Din Oliya, who was the Pir Murshid of Amir Khusro, who cautioned, who urged those who think about the Miraj to have caution and humility and awe in imagining the Miraj. He describes it like this. He came to me wrapped in the cloak of night, approaching with steps of caution and fright then what happened, happened. To say more fails. Imagine the best. Ask not for the details. In skipping the details, Kanan Rafai, like Sheikh Nizam Adin, leaves the best for Allah Ta'ala. God the Absolute, the One, all merciful, always merciful, the gate of mercy beyond reckoning or imagining. For God only knows and performs the best, the most righteous of works. Alhamdulillah. Amin.